There was a fatal school shooting in a high school in New York, in a neighborhood of New York called East New York. And there was a, a eulogy for, what, for the victim, a young man named Ian Moore, at the church of Reverend Johnny Youngblood, who was a community activist and, and had done a great deal of work in trying to rebuild the neighborhood of East New York. And David Dinkins, who was then the mayor of New York, came and spoke at the funeral. And he said to the collective group, that he felt good because he knew that Ian was in heaven with God. And I think that a number of speakers have said, certainly Andre Perry just said, that this is, this is about us, it is about how, how are we caring for our children. So the, the, I'm a psychiatrist and I study societies, and really there's a, a simple message here, which is that we collectively make community. But community, so community is a constant. It's in our minds as a constant. And place is a constant. These things seem to be poverty is a constant, segregation is a constant, life is a constant. Yet the actual nature of community changes. And when a city goes through the kinds of upheaval that your city has gone through, which started back a long time ago, and which includes urban renewal and highway construction and disinvestment and the loss of employment in manufacturing industry, um, all of this kind of upheaval, followed by the problem with Katrina, Rita, and all the extreme weather, repeated upheaval, which has torn apart the community on multiple occasions, the community is not the same community. That's right. And therefore, the job is not the same. That's right. And Dr. Wright said, we need people to come out. There's like a little voice, but we need a boom. But it is very difficult for communities that have been repeatedly fractured to make a boom. So what I'd like to just have you think about in this scene, which is from Pittsburgh's Hill District, was taken by the amazing African-American photographer Charles Tini Harris, whose photographs are now in the archive at the Carnegie Museum of Art. The, this, is a, this is a scene of, of serenity. This is a scene of learning. This is a scene of focus and concentration. When the great psychologist Maslow said that there's a hierarchy of needs, where we, we eat and we have shelter and we get all of that taken care of, and then we can learn and then we can expand our minds, we arrive there in that scene. This is a scene of a neighborhood in that moment of goodness. 
This picture was taken in 1950. This is a very poor African American neighborhood, very similar to black neighborhoods here in New Orleans in 1950. It's not poverty. It's not simply segregation. It's about the integrity of the social bonds, the fact that people had the place under control that allows children to go into the classroom and learn with that degree of peace. It is that which has been destroyed. This is a, another photograph of Charles Teeny Harris. On the streets, men playing checkers, same kind of serenity. This is a marker, it's symbolic of the nature of community, of what people had built together, of what people had achieved. I'd like you to keep those two scenes in mind and look at the next photograph. The same neighborhood, but 50 years later, after urban renewal, after disinvestment, after deindustrialization, most of the people who lived in the Hill worked in the factories in Pittsburgh, and the factories were closed. A precipitous, precipitous catastrophic loss of the steel industry in Pittsburgh, basically a period of 15 years. This is what happens to neighborhoods when there's disinvestment, when there's deindustrialization, when there's urban renewal. Neighborhoods fall apart. There's depopulation. This neighborhood went from 32,000 people to 12,000 people. This is a community, but it is not the same community. And that is the fundamental thought that I really want to give you, is that it's not the same community. So, um, when communities go through the kinds of upheaval that American communities have gone through, they suffer from what I've called root shock. And root shock is the what I have defined it as is the traumatic stress reaction to the loss of all or part of one's emotional ecosystem. What, what does that mean? The emotional ecosystem is, is the big world around us. And if you look on your program, or you look on this right here, the brain has a root. And that root is going down into the soil of the world. And when we are torn out of our neighborhoods by a storm, by the loss of work, by somebody coming through with a freeway, our brain is uprooted, our being is uprooted, and then we have root shock. All the gardeners in the room will know that if you pull a plant out of the soil rudely, the plant goes into a state of shock, and it may or may not recover. That happens to people. People go into a state of shock. And if their neighborhoods are not rebuilt, if their communities are not reassembled, they will really, really, really suffer for a long period of time. So just with this concept of root shock in mind, I want you to look at these three photographs. This is the transformation from 1950 to 1998, a 50-year period. This is the transformation in our community. When people are scratching their heads together and saying, why isn't community like it was? It's because community is not like it was. We are in a different state. And therefore the demands, what do we have to do to reassemble community, are different. Was, well, what happens if you do it over and over and over again? And we have looked at this in a, in a number of communities that have other research groups. With each blow, the community loses some of its integrity and some of its functionality. And in this change of the state of the community, there is a fundamental change in the nature of the behaviors that are appropriate to life in that community. Why is there more violence as communities fall apart? Because in the broken social networks where there is no social control, the job of creating safety falls on the individual. And what does the individual do? The individual picks up the weapons that he or she has available in that new state. And a child that lives in unexpectancy is going to put a weapon in his or her pocket and take it to school. Because it's appropriate to do that. Because things are different. And that's what the young man who did the shooting in 1991 told me. And that's what a young man who did a second shooting in the same high school in 1992 told me 
that people said just don't do that, but that wasn't the reality of their lives. If we want the behaviors to change, it is on us to change the context. And so this terrible context, the emergence of unexpectancy from a context of much more serenity, this is what we have to change, and this is a profoundly difficult job. The thing I'd like to just emphasize, and of course this links directly with Andre Perry's comments about people dying so young, is that repeated upheaval leads to a synergism of plagues. And so many different kinds of plagues have emerged in this period. AIDS, crack cocaine, violence, trauma related to violence, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, asthma, obesity. Um, I, you know, I, I studied so many epidemics emerging in the neighborhoods that I felt kind of like the, the scientific equivalent of a lawyer who chases ambulances. Hmm. And this is all in the context of policies. All these policies, urban renewal, deindustrialization, plant shrinkage, the war on drugs, gentrification, that's a partial list of policies that have undermined neighborhood function in this period of time. We talk about place matters, but the point here is that the place is not stable. Not, not only does your place matter, but the instability of your place. What people can make community if they can have some resources and some stability. If they can't have resources and they can't have stability, things are going to fall apart. And then people are going to do the next best thing. And the next best thing inevitably includes violence. And that turns out to be true in any place of upheaval that you study anywhere around the world. The, the goal here is to, in my view, prevent these terrible consequences of upheaval. And in public health, we talk about three kinds of prevention. We talk about primary prevention, which is the prevention right after the problem. So right after a, a you know, so sort of, I'm sorry, primary prevention is preventing the problem. So right before a storm, they say, you know, evacuate. So, or, you know, if it's not an evacuation situation. Uh, for example, I'm from New Jersey, we just went through Hurricane Sandy, they said, fill up your gas tank before the hurricane, because there's, there's no electricity, the gas pumps won't be working. Make sure you have electric lights, make sure you have food. So they told us a whole list of things to do, and my family, like every other family, went through the checklist and did all of those things to prepare. That's primary prevention. So indeed, there wasn't electricity, and I had gas, which turned out to be really important because my grandson was in the hospital, and it was 40 miles away. And so, because we had filled up, we had two cars, we had filled up the gas tanks, we were able to get to the hospital for a visiting day in that period where there was no gas. So these things are, are very important for prevention. The second part is secondary prevention. So something has happened, how do we start to make it right, right away? We limit the damage. So all of the kinds of things after the storm has happened. So getting the electricity working again, getting the trains working again has been very important. Water got into a lot of houses. They say that in New Jersey, 17,000 structures were badly affected by the storm. Some of those have to be bulldozed right away. Some of them will get rebuilt. A lot of them have water. And so to prevent the growth of mold, they've been stripping them very, very quickly. Like, like in Hoboken, which is a, a waterside town, Basically, the whole town, the first floor of the whole town is on the sidewalk. All, everything stripped down to the studs so that it can be rebuilt. To prevent mold, to get people's houses back, to get the city working again. That's, that's secondary prevention. And then tertiary prevention focuses on, after you have a situation, managing the long-term consequences. In New Orleans, you are dealing with all of these. And so I'd like to link this to this idea that we have destroyed the urban habitat through these policies, and we have destroyed the human ecosystem. The, the ways in which people lived in their places have been destroyed by this long series of policies. And so the recreation of healthy urban habitat depends on primary prevention to protect people's homes, secondary prevention to limit the devastation, and tertiary prevention to rebuild communities. I'd like to propose that in, in our work on collective recovery in these three phases, there are four principles. The first is, and this will be familiar to all ecologists, 
There's no them and there's no there. You are as implicated in Sandy as I was in Katrina. The collective is not the tribe. The collective is larger than any group to which I belong. It is, it is really the all of us. The injury is not solely to the self. It is the, the community, the, the bonds among us that are also injured in all of these situations. And the fourth is that the festival heals the collective. Most of the previous speakers, and this what I would say is really something where I just want to really add something different to what previous speakers have said. They have talked about the services that people need, all kinds of services. But the festival is really a part of it. And I, they say that in New Orleans, you'll know about that. <laughs> Which may be why the other speakers didn't mention it. And it's the story of a community's effort to stop a land grab. The Bruce Ratner's organization, which is a big development corporation, proposed to create an arena for the New York, to bring the Nets to New York and create an arena for them, and also to build a whole group of towers in a neighborhood that was in uh, recovery. So the people in the neighborhood organized to try to stop this. It was a land grab that was supported by the use of eminent domain, which is an important tool for taking land. Yeah. And it happened to be that all of the approvals for this were going to happen outside of the purview of local government. So local government in New York City had nothing to say over this happening. It was going to be decided at the level of New York State, the Empire State Development Corporation. So uh, the people just organized and really fought this for seven years until they lost the very last level of appeal. So the, the primary prevention is recognizing and fighting for the, for the land, for the neighborhood, to keep neighborhoods stable. This is an incredibly important part of what we have to do. Um, and it's really, um, so, so the very primary prevention, which is fighting for neighborhoods, of course, you know, sometimes we're doing all of these things at the same time, we're doing primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. So if you think about people who are displaced by Katrina and then are coming back, so in a sense, the but people want to grab the land, it's both primary and secondary prevention at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. So not to get hung up on it, but the point of this is that keeping the neighborhoods stable, and if people have been displaced, rebuilding them so they can come back to their neighborhoods that this is really, really fundamentally important for having stable, enduring human habitat within which people can live healthy lives. So, communities all over the country have worked on how do you do recovery and secondary prevention. So our research group thought about what, what were the things we had seen around, really around the world that we thought were the kinds of policies that needed to be adopted as secondary prevention after uh, a terrible disaster, such as the hurricanes Katrina and Rita. And we identified these nine habits of highly effective recovery. Um, the first of which is that you acknowledge everyone's suffering, including your own. Now, it's an interesting thing that people who are somewhere else, even people who are involved or pretty near a disaster, will say, nothing happened to me. If my house is okay, then nothing happens to me. And I think that's really a psychological mechanism of defense. Nothing happens to me. Everything around you is a disaster, but nothing happened to you. And so I think that part of this is about really um, understanding that if something terrible happens somewhere in the world, it's happening. It's happening to me. It's happening to you. It's happening to us. We're in this together. The second, and this was actually, I think, uh, very remarkably carried out in our own situation post-Sandy, to practice the democracy and diaspora, all kinds of things were done so that people could vote. And that was, a, uh, I was really glad to see that. And we have to build ecological cities that are beautiful, sustainable, and human-sized. We have to ensure that every citizen has the right to return home. We have to ensure that local companies and workers rebuild the affected areas, give excellent medical care to all, support families as they reestablish themselves, celebrate the area's history and culture, and be generous with the paper clips. There's a, a tremendous impulse to say, well, those people are going to do fraud. Before they've given out a single dollar, as soon as, you know, it's like, oh, $30 billion, well, New Jersey, they're probably going to steal it. 
So, it's like, you yeah, just give them the money, <laughs> it'll be okay. Uh, the, it's a, it's a, it's a concerted commitment, it's a profound commitment to making sure the human communities get working again. I saw this in a remarkable way, or learned the story of how this was carried out in a remarkable way, in a town called Enschede in the Netherlands, um, where there was a huge explosion. And the blew up the whole center of the city. Some old plants that were being used as storage were being used as storage for fireworks. Something caught fire, and all the fireworks just blew up. Terrible, terrible catastrophe. They got together as, as a community, committed to rebuild, committed to rebuild for the people who live there, many of whom were poor, many of whom were immigrants, so not allowing any prejudice to stop them from rebuilding, and to also to think about how the rebuilding could help their city become an even stronger city. Their city had gone through deindustrialization. What to do with this old factory space? And they decided to use it for educational space and cultural space, and so they recreated it that way, but also put in a lot of low-income housing so that all kinds of people could come back. Their city was rebuilt in seven years. Anything can be rebuilt in seven years. Uh, Europe was rebuilt in seven years because of the Marshall Plan. Anything that's not rebuilt in seven years is criminal. That's just how I feel about it. I think seven years is, is the most. How long can people stand to be insecure? Not too long. But if you made a commitment, look, we're going to rebuild it, and say, you can't rebuild it in a day. Rome wasn't built in a day. You can't rebuild it in a year. But seven years, that's the outside of enough. I say that as a psychiatrist. Similarly, in working on tertiary prevention, which my group has spent a lot of time thinking about, we have identified from work in, in Europe and around the United States what we call elements of urban restoration, nine elements of urban restoration. And these are the subject of my uh, book, Urban Alchemy, which comes out in, actually in May. It, it is magical how it works, but it's not magical what you do. And if I tell you these nine elements of urban restoration, you're going to say, I knew that. I could have told you that. And, and you could have, and you did, because it's people like you that told me what they were. I'm not, I'm not about to tell you something magic that you don't know. But what I do want to do is tell you something is tell you that what you know is right. And that probably the piece you don't know is that you have to take seriously that the community is not in the same state it was in prior to all these disasters. That you're dealing with communities that have been fractured, that are that where the little pieces are fighting with each other. It's a very different fabric from the fabric of 1950. And if you get that piece right, it's just like little shredded, wounded, baby hurt community. If you think about it like that, it's like, what has this poor community been through? It's so wounded and so terrified and so angry. Yeah, yeah, we have to calm it. We have to reassure it. We have to get the little pieces back together. We have to reassemble it. We have a lot of gently calming, nurturing work to do. And But it's not anything you don't know how to do. You just haven't necessarily got the right idea in your mind about what to do and how to do it how to put the pieces together. So, I thought I would talk to you about two of these elements, and if the Prezi works, which I can't guarantee, I'll show you videotape. So the first video I want to show you relates to something that Beverly already talked about, which is that when we have problems, we have to get people together and find out what they want. We have to find out what we're for. We can't just fight off the ropes. We can't just say we don't want children to be bad. We have to think, what do we want? We want children to be productive citizens who have jobs and families and contribute as good citizens. And that's what we're for. What are we for? Stephen Covey told us that you start with the end in mind, that the end is a vision. And so we have to get together to do this kind of visioning. If this video works, what I want you to think about it's a very simple video. It's not anything spectacular, but it's in my hometown. We were just gathering people to make a plan for our neighborhood, called one of the neighborhoods called Heart of Orange. 
I just want you to think about how many times you've been in rooms like this and what have you heard. And how is this sort of people, the ideas people throw out, how do they become a plan? How do we understand what we're for? And what do we take away from these events? The, here's what I want you to think about. You, you get a group of people in a room, and Dr. Wright described, you know, you make charts, right, or whatever, you have a map. You look at photographs, you talk about it, or you go make a tour of the neighborhood, and you talk about it. This is, this is not rocket science, right? We have, has everybody here been to a meeting like this where you got together, right? And you talked about the future of what you want. So the question I want to put before you is what happens in such a moment when you're in that meeting? People say things. They don't necessarily say anything that's rocket science. They really don't. They say, oh, yeah, you know, the school that's down the street. I remember when I was in first grade. There's always somebody who will tell you a story about when they were in first grade, right? Or the football stadium. And the time so-and-so ran for a touchdown. Or the band. How much they liked the band. The point is not that these things are rocket science or that we don't all have stories of the church, the school, the football game. The point is that when we tell our stories to each other about the church, the school, the football game, that something happens in our hearts. It's really actually, what they're saying is, is this is their city, this is what they love. The point is, they're together, they're talking to each other, they're assembling, they're assembling. This is, an, this is assembly. It's the pieces of the story. If we did this exercise in this room, each of you would have pieces of the story of this city. Pieces, and those pieces of what it is, what it's like to live there, would get assembled into what you're for in the future. But here you have people gathering to talk about what could they possibly do? What do they love? What could they think about? Where could they go? And Odd things come up. I hope that you can hear the part where they talked about the history of the Presbyterian Church once had a schooner that brought in vodka. I believe it was actually during Prohibition. <laughs> anyway, they brought in vodka, and that's how they made money to build that big church. There are these amazing... Right? There's something about hearing that the Presbyterian Church ran vodka. <laughs> That, it, it just makes you feel like, oh, okay, all right, what can we do? What can we do? What can we make of this? You know, okay, so we're a bunch of black people. We don't have two cents. But we're, we can make something of this. Because it's because it's ours and because we love it. We can make something of our love. What did you love about orange? What do you love about orange? That's the question. This is... We've, we've all done this so many times that sometimes we forget how important it is. And then, you know, we do it, and the policies run ahead of us. And we're like, oh. And it's true, what Dr. Wright said, that there are other things as policy battles that we have to carry. As Andre Perry said, we have to be willing to go to City Hall. We have to be willing to go to the State House once we get these ideas. But, the, but this important act of finding out what we're for, of bringing our visions together. In very shattered communities, there is not a shared vision. And so it is fundamentally important to do these simple things of getting everybody on the same page. When I was talking about what to share with you, uh, with the people that I work with in New Jersey, they said, look, this, this video of our place making is useful to show them, but also show them VAMP. So VAMP is, our um, annual Valley Arts Music and Poetry Festival. And it's an annual party. And it relates to this ninth element of urban restoration, which is celebrate your accomplishments. Part of what paralyzes us when communities are fractured it is what psychiatrists call demoralization. We just, ugh, it's not going to work, why bother? People, people stop voting, they just give up. And so what we have to do is set up a new feedback loop. Because if you do the community meeting and you find out what you're for, 
And then the powers that be make a policy that goes absolutely counter to what you said, you could get discouraged. <laughs> so, and it's very discouraging. So the, the feedback loop can't be that you find out what you're for and then you don't immediately win because that's just too discouraging. The feedback loop has to be something else. And so when, one of the things that I have learned from talking to people all around the nation is that you have to celebrate your accomplishments, however small those accomplishments are. And that the celebrating the accomplishment, the festival heals the collective, sets up a new feedback loop. So this is VAMP 2012. So the same teens that you saw at the festival have organized this group called Orange Inc. Outreaching to the Next Generation Incorporated. They have a youth center in the Valley, Ironworks, and they took charge of VAMP, or Valley Arts Music and Poetry Festival this year. The kids organized the bands. The bands came from all over the region. It had 800 people, which is a big party for a small city. The fashion show was the design group, so the teens made the designs, all the fashion. The teens modeled all the fashion. Obviously, every, even old people were allowed to be in the poetry part of the festival. <laughs> I was representing the seniors. There we go. There we go. And it was, a, it was a great day. It was a great day. And it came out of their vision, right? They were part of the vision. The youth were part of the vision. You saw them in the video helping us think, what are we for? And then we have supported their organization so that they could manifest their dreams, so that they could do live painting. They can put on art shows. They can make fashion. This, this, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. I'm just telling you that this is the tried and true formula that people are using all over the United States and all over the world. We have to stop the breaking of communities because the breaking of communities sets us back. And not just back, like a year back, but back into a state from which it is harder to make progress. But these simple tools, finding out what we're for and celebrating our accomplishments, are tools that we know, that we have in our armamentarium, that we can use to stop the violence, to make the children joyful, to create the serenity they need so that they can be who we want them to be. And I, I'd just like to leave you up, up this image, with this image of um, my daughter who was leading a hike as part of an, another annual festival that we do called Hike the Heights. And all these children from Harlem Children's Zone had a hike from a park at 155th Street, actually had a hike from 145th Street to another park, and they had to go through a small forest. And Molly said to them, there are snakes in the forest. And the little kids are like, ah! And as they went through the forest, they screamed the whole way. And as soon as they got out, they said, can we go again? <laughs> so our children are beautiful. Our children are amazing. And what do we want them to tell God when they get to sit at his right hand? We want them to tell God that we did a great job. Thank you for your attention.